The Living Zen Podcast is a gift from the members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center to you. If you enjoy it, please be sure to let your friends know about Living Zen. If you'd like to support our community, here are a few ways that you can do it. Download the Living Zen Podcast app for iPod, iPhone, or Android. You can also purchase additional Zen Talks by Venerable Eshu on iTunes or Amazon.com. One of the most meaningful ways to show your support is by joining our Sangha as an associate. Your commitment of $10 a month will ensure that offerings like the Living Zen Podcast and our online eZendo will continue to be available around the world to everyone with an interest in truly living Zen. To become an associate, please visit our website at www.zenwest.ca and click on the membership tab. Thank you for your support. Uh, recently, I was asked if I would speak about how to maintain or how to uh, how to do practice when things get difficult. Uh, the person who asked me this uh, recently became the father of twins, uh, and so I think the the question was a, a very dear one, or one that was uh, not just philosophical or conceptual, but very real. How do you maintain practice when things become difficult or complex? I think it's a great question. I think it's a question that probably uh, many people in this room wonder about. But I wanted to sort of first back up a little bit and look at uh, why we practice or how we practice to begin with. Maybe even why we call it practice. So a lot of people come to uh, this meditation group or meditation groups wherever they might be, often out of, uh, in a state of turmoil or in a state of difficulty. Many people come uh, because something emotional has happened. Maybe there's been some kind of a relationship breakup or maybe there's been some kind of uh, loss of employment or identity crisis or some kind of big problem and uh, their head won't stop bothering them or their heart won't stop bothering them or sometimes even uh, there's physical manifestations of what's going on inside and someone says hey you should try meditation and uh, many of you know uh, before uh, I became the abbot, the full-time abbot of the Victoria Zen Center, I had a, a background in uh, mental health and addiction services as well. And uh, there's, a, there's a similarity or there's a commonality to the way that people engage with this practice and the way that people engage with things like medications, like uh, antidepressants or antipsychotics or th things like this. So we have a problem, we have a crisis, and so we look for help because we're in this crisis position. And so maybe we find something, maybe we uh, start to do this meditation. We start to sit down and sit still, engage with our breathing, and we begin to investigate what's going on. We begin to experience, for the first time maybe, what's going on in our minds and in our hearts. And as we sit, as we become aware of what's going on, as we become more and more able to see how we are engaging, how we are um, choosing to perpetuate uh, difficult or harmful patterns and habits, we begin to let go of them a little bit. They begin to disengage a little bit. We begin to feel a little bit more free, less fixed. When difficult situations arise, we become able to see them more clearly. We begin to have more um, sort of internal fortitude to resist those habitual patterns. And as a result, our situation begins to become a little bit better. We find that we start to feel 
a little bit happier maybe, or we find that we're able to not get so engaged or hooked in by circumstances that we've uh, always seemed to get hooked into. After a little while, we start to feel so good and practice this activity of just sitting with who we are and what's coming up in our bodies and hearts and minds in each moment uh, can become difficult. It can become really dry, really boring. And so uh, it's really easy for us to sit here and think, oh, well, I'm fixed. You know, I'm not so angry or upset or scared anymore. I think I can get on with life. And this coming on a Tuesday night business or coming out to a meditation hall or being involved with this community that says, you know, keep digging, keep going at this, that's just a lot of work. I can can take it from here. I'll be fine on my own. And I see people like this all the time. I've been uh, 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 a Zen monk for... um, uh, 12 years now. And uh, uh, I can't, I, I shouldn't say like, I see this all the time. There's people like this. I mean, I was that person too, certainly. I think at some point we're all like this. We think, oh, I'm fixed or oh, things are better now. But as I spoke about at great length last week, uh, these habit patterns, these um, cycling uh, uh, addictions or, or uh Uh, uh, momentous uh, habits that we have, they have a tremendous momentum. And the awareness, the presence, the ability to ground or find our home foundation that we find through meditation practice that allows us to see those things as they arise and help us to not get hooked into them, uh, they require this basis of practice, this continuous effort to be present, to be aware to what's going on in our bodies, in our hearts, and in our minds. And what I've found for myself and what I have found in many people who have practiced with me over the years is that if we don't do this, if we don't engage in this regular practice, that's why we call it practice, these habits are uh, very quick to reassert themselves. And so often what I'll see is people who come to the Zen Center for a little while, and they really love practice usually. I love this meditation. Zen is great. And then after a few months, things calm down in their lives. Things stabilize. And then you see less and less of them. And then maybe you don't see anything of them. There's no sound for a couple of years. And then there's this sort of fiery return on the wings of some, the next crisis. Ah, I need to, uh, to do some meditation. And, oh, I don't know what happened or why I stopped or all of these kinds of things. It's called practice. Uh, one of the, the real um, uh, points, real, one of the real uh, principles of practice that I want to press upon each of you tonight is that it's always easy to practice when practice is easy. Does this make sense? You know, it's uh, when things are, uh, there's grist for the mill, when we're really clear on why it is that we're practicing, when our heads are full of garbage and and our hearts are, are totally torn apart, we think, oh, I need to meditate because it will help me with this. And in this way, we can understand these three treasures that are spoken about in Buddhism, why they're called refuge. Because it's a place that we can find a home. It's a place where we can find uh, solace from this storm of thoughts and emotions. But what's difficult is to practice uh, when things are calm when the seas are calm, when things become stable. 
because we look around and we figure, I've won. Again, we make this mistake of thinking that things are fixed, that we've reached some point, that we've managed to uh, attain something. And so we figure, oh, good, I've finished now, so I can just go about my merry life and not need this. And so we keep coming up against difficult situations in this way. Every time something difficult comes up, if we're not uh, prepared, if we're not practicing, if we're not uh, engaging in the constant um, development or cultivation of this mind, this heart, this body, that can see habits as they arise. They can see uh, our, our uh, tendencies to move away from the things that we think are going to make us unhappy. If we can't see ourselves chasing after the things that we think are going to give us lasting satisfaction, then there's no way that we can escape it. So I like to think of meditation practice, like a daily, consistent meditation practice, something like a martial training. You know, like we're not always in combat, but you can't start practicing for combat when someone's in your face. That's a bad time to think, oh, I really should have done that martial training. Or if you don't like that metaphor, some people really get upset when I talk about martial arts. We could look at it like first aid training or emergency preparedness. That's maybe Zen practice is a spiritual emergency preparedness training. Does that work as a metaphor for people? Yeah. When an earthquake happens is a bad time to think I should have stored some water. You need to have done it. You need to have prepared. And so this is what we're doing when we engage in this practice in a consistent and stable way. Another um, uh, tool or another uh, uh, yeah, tool that I'd like to offer as far as how to approach life, how to approach practice, how to approach obstacles, difficulties in life, is something that a, a Buddhist teacher named Shantideva talks about in a, a text which is translated into English as the way of the Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva it means uh, a being of awakening, an awakening being. It's you, somebody who is engaged in the practice of awakening, awakening for yourself and for all beings. And he makes this very logical point. He says, from the perspective of Buddhism, uh, we have these things in Buddhism called um, paramitas, uh, perfections. They're kind of like virtues. They're things like uh, charity, patience, uh, compassion, uh, zeal, uh, wisdom. And I think every religious tradition, and I think generally even a scientific-minded uh, person, can look at these things and say that these, these virtues are really the, the pinnacle of what it is to be a human being. If we can... Uh, manifest these virtues, then we're really giving full body to the greatest capacity of what it is to be a human being. This is the perspective of Buddhism generally. This is part of why we practice. Now, Shantideva makes a, a, a very interesting point about these things and says, it is impossible to cultivate patience if no one ever keeps you waiting. It's impossible to develop compassion if you never come across somebody who is suffering. It's impossible to uh, cultivate charity, selfless giving, if you don't come across somebody who is in need. So as we go through our lives, it's very easy for us 
to find things that run into our paths, that seem like obstacles, that are absolutely difficult, that cause us problems and make us mad and slow us down and uh, get in the way and stop us from what we're doing. And we can look at those things as bad. We can look at those things as the cause of our suffering. We can look at those things as uh, evil, even. But Shantideva uh, asks that we stop for a moment, that we just take a breath, and that we understand. We look at these things from the other perspective, which is to say that were it not for these obstacles, were it not for these challenges, for these losses, for these uh, problems and sufferings and issues, there is no other ground for us to engage in the practice of these virtues. There's no other place for us to have the opportunity to become what we can truly become as human beings, which in Buddhist terms means these obstacles become the opportunity for us to manifest as bodhisattvas, beings of awakening. It's a, uh, a difficult path. It's a difficult way to approach our lives. It's a difficult way to face the sicknesses and deaths of friends. It's a difficult way to perceive uh, the demonic children that are keeping us from sleep night after night after night, or the ailing mother-in-laws who are invading our homes and taking over our spaces and uh, ruining our marital relationships. But Shantideva asks that we open our eyes and look at these situations. Look at that person that's cut you off. Look at the person who's uh, cut in front of you in the line. And instead of responding with anger, and instead of responding with uh, uh, self-motivated grief or upset, if we're able to breathe, if we're able to allow ourselves to dissolve into the situation, we will find that what arises are these very virtues, selfless giving. This person who has asked us for something transforms from somebody who wants to take something from us into somebody who is offering us the opportunity to manifest dana paramita, selfless giving, offering us the opportunity to manifest a quality which makes human beings what they are, which makes human beings capable of Buddhahood. That person who's always late, who never uh, comes on time, who keeps us waiting, allows us to manifest patience, we are able to manifest as the bodhisattva of patience if we're able to transform the situation. This person changes from being a big pain in the ass to being a bodhisattva, somebody who is uh, powerfully offering us an opportunity to engage in cultivating, in developing the very qualities which bring us to our greatest potential as human beings. Now, I recognize, oh boy, do I recognize that these are big steps. It's not easy. We're in a culture that gives us every cue that we should get angry, that we should fight back, that we should 
demand our uh, rights and our privileges and uh, our spot in line. But just think about this perspective. I'm not asking anyone to be perfect about it. I'm not asking anyone to always look at that person that's causing us a difficulty as a great benefactor and bow in thanks. But as we practice in a steady, consistent way, what we find is that if we apply this perspective consistently, if we just are willing to open up a bit, if we're just uh, established enough in our practice that for a moment we can open to this possibility, you will experience your life uh, as it transforms. No longer are we uh, these sort of isolated beings sort of bumping around in the cosmos, constantly beset upon by tragedy and hardship. But we become beings who are becoming more and more aware, more and more uh, awake, more and more open to the experience of this unfolding moment more and more aware to the experience of what it is to be alive in this unfolding moment. Consistency, regularity, stability in practice is what I emphasize over and over and over again. When hardship meets us, when difficulty meets us, when we find ourselves being stretched or challenged, it's my perspective that this is why we must practice. We don't practice for the times when we are not uh, in demand. We don't practice for the times when things are going smoothly and easily. We practice so that when the shit hits the fan, we are prepared. Not prepared like with a step-by-step plan, but our hearts and our minds and our bodies are open to the possibility. We're willing to work with what arises in our lives. We're not shutting down out of fear or out of anger or out of guilt, but we're open, willing to embrace each moment of our, of our lives as it arises, regardless of what it contains. So, uh, the short answer, how do you continue? How do you maintain your practice when things are difficult? Is simply that you must maintain your practice, you must deepen your practice, You must engage with your practice of your life when things are easy. Thanks for listening to the Living Zen Podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.